So welcome everyone to another Monday meetup. Here we are on February 22nd, and I'd like to welcome all of you this evening. We have Igor Klibanov here with us, and he is going to tell us quite a bit about his journey, and he's had uh, quite an interesting path that I think we can all learn from. Hi, Katie. And um, I think what I'm going to start off with, first of all, is um, just introducing Igor. He owns uh, a company called Fitness Solutions Plus, and he has authored six books now. And he is, I think you're working with clients as well as have a team working with clients. Yes? Correct. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent. Well, welcome. Thank you very much for agreeing to be on our weekly show or production. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to this. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So I think first of all, hey, Jillian, I think first of all, we will just start off by asking you, how did you get involved in our industry? What kind of piqued your interest and in, and what made you jump in? Yeah, well, um, it's, a, it's, it's a funny story with lots of twists and turns. But um, all throughout high school, I wanted, I, I thought I would be a computer programmer um, because, yeah, yeah, because, that uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's one thing a lot of people don't know about me um, because uh, my dad is, uh, at that time, he was a computer programmer. Now he's doing something else in IT. Um, and so um, he, when it came time to choosing courses for, uh, for grade 12 and for university applications, um, my parents really wanted me to be really wanted me to be a computer programmer because my dad liked his career. He thought I would like his career. Uh, never mind that I had no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Never mind that I had no interest or aptitude for technology. Even when I was uh, seventeen, I was like the oldest seventeen-year-old you you yeah, you could know. Like I had no interest in tech or anything like that. Still don't. Um, I have the technology of an eighty-year-old. Uh, <laughs> So definitely no aptitude, no interest in it. So I actually applied to three programs in grade 12. Um, choice number one uh, on my university applications was uh, University of Toronto Computer Science. That's my parents' first choice. Uh, choice number two, <laughs> York University Computer Science. Uh, choice number three, York University Kinesiology. That's yeah. my real first choice. <laughs> um, I got into all three programs, but I, I obviously I accepted the kinesiology uh, path and um, do you know what happens in Russian households when you disobey your parents? <laughs> Probably the Nothing same thing good. that happens in most households. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. The guillotine comes out. Yes. Um, anyways, uh, fast forward a few months, I actually ended up going to kinesiology. Um, and there was a yada, first, yada, yada there we'll never hear, right? Yeah, yeah, essentially. <laughs> and uh, all throughout kinesiology, as all throughout my undergrad, I was working as a personal trainer at both a community, community center and a country club. Um, it's, it's time for fourth year. Fourth year, I apply. Uh, I applied to physiotherapy school. Um, to be fair, I just applied to University of Toronto and that's it. I uh, didn't get accepted. Um, tried to do it again one more year later uh, after already working for a year. Uh, again, didn't get accepted. And then I'm thinking to myself, uh, well, why do I want to be in physiotherapy if I'm making the same amount of money as a personal trainer, if I'm uh -huh. working on my own, of course, um, and going $50,000 in debt? I mean, I could just do what I'm doing now, but freelancing. So I thought, why, so why, why do I want to go into physiotherapy? I'm like, oh yeah, my parents want me to go. Um, oh, <laughs> so interesting. yeah, yeah. So I thought to myself, well, forget this. I actually quite like personal training. Like this is the end point for me. I'm very happy personal training. I love it. Um, so I thought, okay, let me start my own business. Um, well, actually, it was but that won't like, send your parents over a cliff, will it? No. Well, they're like, well, he's not getting to physiotherapy. What else is he gonna do? He might as well work. <laughs> His uh, life's that, pretty much over now. <laughs> yeah, they weren't as disappointed about that as they were about me uh, not 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 accepting computer science. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, so I was already working at a, at, at the country club. And, uh, and at the country club, as a personal trainer, I was uh, breaking all kinds of sales records. Um, and it wasn't a new club, it was a 51 year old club at the time. So I was breaking a lot of sales records. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, on two occasions, my manager told me that I wasn't allowed to make more money than her. Um, <laughs> Cause uh, oh, I was- Oh, that's too yeah. bad. <laughs> I was 22, 23 at the time. She was about 47, 48. Um, How dare you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. How dare you? 
Um, so she said it twice. At that point, I knew this is not a joke. And then she started creating rules to prevent me from making more money than her. Um, what? Yeah, oh. yeah. Um, so I thought, well, you know what? I'm getting, I'm breaking sales records. I can go out on my own. I'll still be, I'll still be, I'll be fine. Um, so I went out on my own, um, handed in my resignation notice with uh, very, very shaky hands. Cause, uh, cause I didn't know what it's going to be. There's no security of having a job or a steady paycheck. Um, so I went out on my own and I thought to myself, well, I'm a good trainer. I mean, I'm getting breaking sales records. Um, so I'll do fine on my own. And that's when reality hit me that being a good trainer is not good enough to, uh, to build your business. You actually have to have to have some skill yeah. in sales and marketing. Just knowing what extras and nutrition is not enough. You have to let everybody know that you're a good trainer. That's where sales and marketing comes in. So I was already an avid book whore up until that time. Um, I was reading about 70 to 80 books per year. Um, wow. All were in the realm of exercise and nutrition. Well, I figured, well, now I'm in business on my own. I should probably read something about marketing and sales. So I started to devote some of those 70 to 80 books towards marketing and sales. And then I started testing different strategies, seeing what worked, what didn't work. Um, and uh, tracking everything along the way in an Excel document. Uh, here's what I did. Here's how it worked or didn't work, and et cetera. Oh, very good. Yeah. Very good. What was your most uh, favorite sales book that you can remember that made an impact? By far, the best one I've ever read is called Spin Selling, S P I N Selling by a guy named Neil Rackham, R A C C K H A M. Neil Rackham, Spin Selling. By far the best one I've ever read. Oh, okay. Oops. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so I start, I started testing out different strategies, different tactics, um, came, came across a ton of failure about 45 or 46 different, uh, strategies and tactics that I've tried that it yielded completely zero results, but I still kept testing, trying until I came across the first one that worked, which is public speaking. Um, okay. so I started to do that, uh, I came across the second one that worked, which is email marketing. Uh, but, uh, but along the way I blew a ton of money and a ton of time on stuff that didn't work. Um, ads in newspapers, social media management, paper click ads, a uh, ton of stuff that didn't work, but eventually came across public speaking and email marketing and that worked like gangbusters. So it grew my company from, well, just a one-man operation to, well, now 14 trainers working for me plus three staff that are not trainers. Oh, wow. Incredible. Incredible. So you stumbled on this perfect formula. You, you think it was the email marketing that was really the thing that kind of pushed it over the edge? It was like a one-two punch. The, uh, the one-two punch was public speaking and the second one-two punch oh, wow. was marketing because the way people got onto my email marketing list is through my public speaking engagements. Right, right, right. Very nice. And so how do you find your public speaking engagements? Uh, there is a database called Reference Canada. Um, so you go on it, you, you specify which criteria you want. Like I want a company with this many employees or this few employees in this geographical area with this amount of sales volume, et cetera. And then right. I hire somebody to find the, uh, the name and the, and the content information of the CEO, COO, and HR manager. And I send an email to all three people, uh, referencing the other two people that I, that, that I emailed basically saying in more elegant terms, do you want me to come and speak at your company? Um, <laughs> And uh, for every 50, 50 companies that I email, about one says yes. That's a pretty good return. Yeah, yeah. It's so pretty it's, good it's return because I bet you your introductory emails look sort of similar. So they don't need a, a lot of work to be nope. redistributed out to the other, you know, the next company in line. Yeah, it's literally just co copy paste, tweak a few words here and there. So it's, so it's personalized. Um, right. and the way you go. No, I don't, I, I don't do this myself. My assistant does it for me. So it's, I really just show up and speak. That's, that's fantastic. And so have you been able to do that just during COVID times as well? No, during COVID, we took a different strategy. Um, oh. In-person seminars are by far the best thing that I can do for profitability, et cetera. Mm -hmm. However, in-person seminars are not an option during COVID. <laughs> um, so I tried, I tried doing webinars for corporations, but attendance is horrible. Um, okay. to, to compare the numbers, if I'm doing an in-person seminar, about half of those who register will show up. So if I have 40 registrants, 20 will show up uh, from a corporation. By comparison, mm -hmm. if I'm doing a webinar for a corporation, so about around 20% will show up, uh, if that, if that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not worthwhile doing public speaking uh, in that format during uh, during COVID. However, what I have been doing is webinars for my own email list as well as for other partners, naturopathic doctors, uh, dietitians, etc. Uh, that that has been much more fruitful than uh, corporations. 
So very interesting. Um, if we turn to the different books that you've been writing and, and you've got quite a, a range, um, will, will you be asked to speak about the topics of your books when you go to, to speak to NDs and, and uh, other healthcare pros or are they looking for something very, very different when you go to meet with them? Yeah, it's almost always my books. Uh, my okay. number one talk is called Stop Exercising the Way You Are Doing It Now. Uh, first came the seminars, then came the book um, on that topic. Okay. I'm like, I'm right. speaking about this so much, I might as well put it on paper. Uh, and then <laughs> yeah. that on Amazon. Right. Um, so I did that. And probably about right now, about 60 or 70% of my speaking engagements are all just this, this topic. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. Although I have 22 different topics, but still, like I said, 60, 70% are just that topic. Uh, my other most popular topic is this one the mental health prescription. Um, and that one I'm actually giving away to everybody listening right now and uh, to the recording. If you just go to fitnesssolutionsplus.ca slash kinesiology, which is in the chat box right now. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's my second most popular topic, although I have uh, literally 20 others. <laughs> incredible, incredible. So, um, when you are talking about stop exercising the way you're doing it now, for example, and you mentioned that you're saying the same things over and over and you're putting them down into a book because obviously more and more people are very interested in that. What would be some of your top five uh, things that you might recommend um, to people when, when you are coming to them with this talk saying stop exercising the way you're doing it now? Yeah, well, this is probably not gonna be news to, uh, to a group of kinesiologists, but to the general public, it will be. Um, but uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most important things, of course, is stress management uh, for the simple reason that it, 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 it you know, dips into so many different areas of, of life, especially if we're, if we're talking about fat loss. I was reading one study about um, how, how stress affects um, eating behavior. Um, I don't know if we have a bunch of uh, geeks in the participants, but I, 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 yes, I usually like to talk about studies. Um, so I was reading this one study where researchers um, subjected groups of, of women to a stressful, uh, to three stressful events. Event number one, they had to do difficult math, um, like counting backwards from, from 100 and very difficult um, numbers. Uh, stressful event number two, they had to complete a puzzle with an unrealistic time limit. And stressful event number three, they had to do public speaking in front of an audience. Um, and so all the women in this study were subjected to the exact to the three to the to the exact same stressors, and their cortisol level, levels were measured before the stressor and after the stressor. <laughs> so although the objective what event was the same, yeah. yeah, yeah, fascinating study. <laughs> so although the objective event was the same, three different stressors, one group of women they categorized as low stress reactors, the other as high stress reactors. Those who secreted just a little bit more bit of cortisol in response to those uh, three events. Um, were, were categorized as low stress reactors. Those, those who secreted um, more cortisol in response to those events so were considered high stress reactors. And here's what they noticed. The high stress, uh, stress reactors uh, ate 79 more calories in the, in the meal after the, the three stressful events than low stress reactors. How fascinating. Oh, oh, do you think it was triggered by the cortisol then? Because we know yes. that cortisol has an effect on leptin levels, which makes you, or sorry, on ghrelin levels, which make you hungrier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, also, it uh, it raises blood sugar and then insulin counteracts it, lowers blood sugar. So there's okay. just a whole interesting interplay of, of what's going on. And that's just one stressful event. Um, I mean, divided into three different um, subjects, one stressful event um, with one meal. Now imagine if somebody's under chronic stress and it's not just one meal that's measured, but three different meals. Um, so it's not that, yes, we were trying, we're looking for diets and so on. But I often say that if you've lost weight, in the past, your diet is not the problem. Uh, it's usually emotional eating, stress eating, cravings, planning, stuff like that. Um, and so if it's emotional eating, the problem is emotional. If it's a matter of planning, the problem is logistical. And I, I'm fond of saying we don't solve emotional and logistical problems with nutritional solutions. Uh, we solve them with emotional, with emotional solutions like cognitive behavioral therapy um, or exercises at least. Um, logistical solutions, cleaning up your covers, stuff like that. Uh, so that's one of the things that I talk about stress. The other one is sleep. Uh, the two go hand in hand. And sometimes I'm stressed, so I can't sleep, and I can't sleep, so I'm stressed. I'm extra reactive to stress. <laughs> uh, exactly, exactly. And um, just good restful sleep will decrease cravings by by, by a lot. Uh, imagine if you're sleeping six hours per night and somebody else is sleeping eight hours per night. 
well, that's two extra hours as an opportunity to eat for, for no other reason than that. <laughs> I never thought uh, of it that way. <laughs> I mean, just so, so simple. But also right. the foods that you go for are higher calorie, higher sugar, higher fat, like richer foods. Uh, so that's another one, sleep. How do you optimize that? How do you prove that? Uh, three, strength training. And I'm not going to belabor this one. So you're a kinesiologist, obviously. Uh, but strength training goes a long way. Uh, four, hormonal balance. So it's important to have your hormones tested. Um, and when we work with clients, we like a combination of objective blood, blood tests, but also symptoms. Um, when you combine the two, you have a more complete picture of what's going on in the body. The reason I don't like to use either one by themselves is because with symptoms, uh, sometimes somebody looks symptomatically, they look great. But you look at them visibly and you're like, something's not right. You have bags <laughs> under your eyes, your waist circumference is 51 inches and you weigh 300 pounds. Something's wrong, but symptomatically they feel good. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, I don't like to rely on blood work myself either because I can't tell you how many clients I've had that come to me and say, well, Igor, my blood, work's low. My, my blood work looks normal. Then why do I feel so crummy? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I like to combine blood work and symptoms. Um, and heck, if they have other tests, saliva, urine, stuff like that, I'm happy to look at that as well. Um, so that's number are four. Those, uh, sorry, are those blood tests yeah. uh, ones that you are asking the clients to ask their physicians for, and you're telling them, here are the things I want to make sure that you ask for, for your physician okay. to order in that blood test? Yeah. So I have a list of 49 different tests uh, mm -hmm. that I ask them to ask their doctor to run. Uh, now very rarely will the doctor actually run all of those because they're like, who is this personal trainer told you to do this? <laughs> uh, get real here. Uh, but I tell them, take it to them anyway. They're going to run more than they would have run without it. Right. Um, and yeah. whatever they don't run, take it to a walk-in clinic and ask them for the rest. Um, and heck, worst comes to worst, pay for it for the rest out of, out of pocket. Uh, right. there are labs that sell direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's number four, uh, get your hormones tested. Number five, improve your digestion. If there's room for improvement, sometimes your digestion is fine. There's nothing to improve. But if your digestion is compromised, uh, that's going to undermine your efforts at overall good health. So those mm -hmm. would be my probably top five that I talk about in that book. That's that's fantastic. Did that surprise anyone? As uh, yeah. as Igor went through the list, no, no, yeah, nobody. Didn't, didn't I'm, I'm speaking to a very smart kinesiologist. I didn't think anybody <laughs> would be surprised. <by> those. <laughs> I just finished listening to the book Sleep Smarter by Sean Stevenson over the weekend. Okay. Holy smoke. We learned a lot about sleep at nutrition school. We didn't learn anything about sleep and kinesiology. Maybe that's changed now, but um, holy smoke. It's, uh, it's quite unbelievable how, uh, how sleep makes a, a massive impact on what our clients can do and, and what we can manage in a day. So that was, that was super surprising. I list. Yeah, I would highly suggest it. Um, <laughs> plugging his podcast too is fantastic part of it i admit i like his voice <laughs> but the other part is that um he's got a really friendly casual way about him and i think igor you'll really resonate with his messages um so awesome. his his podcast is called the model health show and if you saw him you'd realize why it's called the model health show but um he he's just got another new book out called Eat Smarter, which I can't wait to get my hands on because it also segues into um, another book that I wanted to talk about with you this evening, which is your latest book about blood pressure and all yeah. of the things that can influence blood pressure and what advice you might typically give as a kinesiologist to your clients about controlling some of these lifestyle factors that could lead to blood pressure. So maybe if you don't mind, you can speak a little bit to your newest book uh, and uh, give us an idea of what um, you might say to a client who's saying, oh, I'm on all this medication. My blood pressure is fine. And you're like, no, you're on medication. You are not fine. So let's <laughs> read that and figure out why you're on this statin. And now you've got all these side effects that we have to manage as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my message is, are your medications they say yes. I'm like, well, healthy people are not medications. That's right. Uh, <laughs> so let's get you healthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's get you healthy. Um, now, I wanna, I wanna do the, uh, the obligatory disclaimer of I never tell my clients anything. Get on your medications. Get off your medications. Adjust your dosage. Don't tell them any of that stuff. Exactly. I tell them about that. Talk to your doctor. Um, but in regards to high blood pressure, um, uh, uh, there, there's what's called primary hypertension and secondary hypertension. Um, primary hypertension just means there's, we understand why there's high blood pressure. You may have kidney damage and therefore you have high blood pressure. You may have hyperthyroidism and therefore you have high blood pressure. Uh, there it's a very established cause. It's a secondary reason. 
Um, the other kind of hypertension, um, secondary hypertension, also known as idiopathic hypertension, means that you have high blood pressure and we don't know why. Um, <laughs> And yet we kind of know why, because if you improve your nutrition, you're exercising your sleep, you're, you don't have high, high blood pressure anymore. Um, uh, so I get, to me, I guess the nomenclature is a little bit, a little bit confusing, um, but nonetheless, um, if they have idiopathic high blood pressure, um, then we, we, we have to figure that it's probably a lifestyle disease. Uh, it's probably a condition of they're not eating right, they're not sleeping well, um, they are not exercising, et cetera. Um, and so if they have a habit of, let's say, 40, 50, 60 plus years of bad habits, it's very difficult to do a, 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 an entire lifestyle change. We're not going to change everything. We're not going to change their nutrition and their exercise and their sleep and their supplements. We have to just pick one. Um, and from a perspective of behavior change, it's much, much, much easier to change one habit at a time. Uh, I'm, I'm going to reference another study here. Um, so... Researchers wanted to find out what's the what's the best thing you can do for behavior change, and so they divided participants into three different groups. Group number one only uh, they picked which one habit they would change. Group number two picked two habits to change. Group number three picked three habits to change. And after I believe it was either people with high blood pressure to start with. No, no. Uh, so unrelated to, to blood pressure, just just in general about behavior yeah. change. I think they were just trying to get healthier overall. Right. Um, and, uh, and after either six or 12 weeks, they don't run the timeline, group number one, who only made one change, 83% of them stuck with a change after that six to 12, uh, 12 week period. Group number two, it dropped to 29%. Whoa. Yeah, and group number three, 7%. Uh, so huge, huge uh, a, a one jump thing. from yeah. one habit to just two, and another big one from two to three. Um, that's really interesting is Kins working on behavior change because that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so if we want our clients to change, we can't throw an entire lifestyle overhaul at them. <laughs> we got to ask them. We don't prescribe. We, we, uh, we, we give them a choice of that's a good choice. That's a good choice. That's a good choice. That's a good choice. Which of these good, which one of these good choices would you like to make? Um, and I generally divide it up into like four different categories, exercise, nutrition, supplement, sleep. Um, from an exercise perspective, like the easiest thing you, do, you can do that I talk about in my book is just squeeze your fists with about 30% force for two minutes, rest for three minutes, and repeat that three more sets three times a week. Um, that by itself, yep, yeah. 30% force. That's it. Simple. Dead simple. Easy compliance. 24 minutes per week. You don't got to go to the gym. You can do it on the couch in between, uh, in, in, like during commercial breaks. Uh, that's, that's the exercise, for example. Nutrition, I, I don't necessarily tell them what to remove unless they're, unless they're like, oh yeah, that's easy to remove. Um, instead, I tell them what to add. Um, I give them a quota. I tell them, here's a, a list of 15 or 20 different foods that you can choose from. Choose one to eat with each meal. Um, oh, good. Yeah, because naturally, good stuff pushes bad stuff out. That's one. And two, when you tell them what they can't have, what, you, what they can't have now becomes seductive. They want to have it. Right. Um, so I, I rarely will I tell them what they can't have unless I ask them, would you be okay with removing this? If they're like, yeah, that's no problem. Like, sure, let's, let's do that. But if they're like, well, maybe if I see any hesitation, I don't go with that. Yeah. Um, and there's, fortunately, there's not a lot, a lot to remove. Like the biggest culprit, bigger than sodium, is energy drinks. Um, yes, yes. Isn't that surprising? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which makes sense. I mean, they are loaded with caffeine. But unlike coffee or tea, which also have caffeine, they also have an amino acid called theanine or can and, and catechins to counteract that. Energy drinks don't have theanine or catechins. Um, it's it's all unopposed caffeine. Um, mm -hmm. So I so so energy drinks would be my pretty much the only thing I would actually like actively remove. And sodium, I don't you don't remove it, but you you lower it if possible. Mm -hmm. um, but a bigger effect than lowering sodium is augmenting potassium. Uh, sodium restriction on average lowers blood pressure about two or three millimeters of mercury. Potassium augmentation lowers uh, blood pressure between seven and nine millimeters of mercury. Um, so just more bang for your buck with, with no restriction. On the supplement side of things, yeah. um, there's, there's a lot of different supplements that you can use for high blood pressure, but there's three or four that, that lower it a lot. Um, like we're talking between like 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury, which is wow. significant. Um, some of the most effective ones are coenzyme Q10, uh, greens drinks, uh, magnesium, 
and, uh, and olive leaf extract. Uh, there are other ones that lower it, but not quite as much. Now, of course, I never tell them you should take these supplements. I'm not allowed to do that. I'm also not, I, I'm also, I also don't say that if, uh, if you take this supplement, it will lower your blood pressure. I'm not allowed to do that either. Mm -hmm. What I am allowed to do is I'm allowed to say, research shows that um, this supplement lowers, uh, lowers blood pressure by this much. What I'm also allowed to say is other clients or other people who've taken the supplement have seen uh, impressive reductions in blood pressure. I, I, of course, tell them, go see your pharmacist before you start taking this. I never say go see your doctor because doctors just don't know supplements. That's not, that's not their training. Very true. It's very true. Yeah. Like I just had a client taking a, yeah. I just had a client who was hitting, oh, she was above uh, seven millimolars uh, per liter on her uh, glucose test that she just completed. Yeah. And so she doesn't quite meet the threshold for metformin prescription, yeah. which would have solved other problems, metformin should be like a street drug, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's a it's a quite a wonder drug. But um, I said, okay, how about berberine? And uh, he said, oh, yes, yes, that would be great because he he Health Canada says he's not allowed to do this. But if I make the suggestion as a nutritionist, I can say, well, how about this? And here's the research. And he said, yep. thank you. Yes, let's do that. So. They, they don't know supplements, but they're usually very open to hearing about research behind any, yes. any supplement. And then they, they say, absolutely, fire me the research and, and you've got that. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. If you come at a doctor with research, awesome. But mm -hmm. some doctors, let, let me rephrase, a lot of doctors won't even read the research. Yeah, so I right. just say, go, go, go to a pharmacist. Yeah. Pharmacists are actually trained in supplements. They know supplements. And yeah. furthermore, they know drug nutrient interactions. So mm -hmm. I never say go to a doctor, go to a pharmacist. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to go to a doctor, but go to a pharmacist first. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah they're sleep. a good secret weapon that we don't often pay attention to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, berberine is one of the most tried, tested, and true. Tons of research behind it. Yeah. Um, my next book, which I'm actually working on right now, is actually a follow-up to the high blood pressure book called mm -hmm. Type 2 Diabetes Reversal Secrets. And one of the secrets is berberine. Berberine. Yeah, good. Yeah. That's excellent. That's really, really good. And the fourth strategy, of course, is sleep. Um, in the general population, sleep apnea is about five or 6% of the general population has sleep apnea in the hypertensive population, something like 35%. And to take things a step further in hypertensives that have what's called, bless you, um, resistant hypertension, which is they're already on three medications for hypertension and it's still high. It's, it's not going down below 140 over 90 for those people in that population, uh, 70, uh, about 70% of them have sleep apnea. Um, and so I say for anybody who's hypertensive, resistant or not, uh, you should be getting tested for sleep apnea because chances are you probably have it. Uh, mm -hmm. so those would be my four, uh, my four secrets for high blood pressure reversal, uh, exercise, nutrition, supplement sleep. Amazing. Amazing. Any questions from anyone so far? I agree with the pharmacist. My best friend is a pharmacist and I agree. Uh, <laughs> I support pharmacists. I Good. think a very clients. underutilized healthcare profession that we sort of, we, we don't see, we forget about because we think, you know, they're just in the back compounding um, yep. medications for us. And I've had some long chats with pharmacists. Uh, there's one particular one where uh, I could just, you know, sit there and, and talk his ear off and he's quite happy to explain yeah. what he knows. And, and I can come to him with, uh, anonymized list of medications from clients of mine and he knows who it is huh. because they are they are a customer at this particular shopper's drug mart so he knows but I blacked out the names okay and I've said can we speak about this and he said yes we can speak about this because you have taken precautions to hide this person's identity and I'm not going to acknowledge that I know who it is and so we go, we go through the medications and it's, it's so interesting because I say, look, you know, there's, there's 13 here. Is there any uh, way that we could speak to the physician because I'm having to hear about the side effects. So yeah. um, it becomes quite a concern. So the pharmacist can be super helpful in even helping us understand some of the medications that we're seeing in our clients' files too. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, a lot of the complaints that I hear from my clients um, is that my doctor will only see, see me for four minutes and then get out of my office. 
pharmacists, by, by, by comparison, they're less busy and therefore way, way more patient. They have way more time to get to a person. They'll sit down with them. They have a private office usually. They'll talk to them, explain. Um, and it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. They'll spend way more time. Yeah, so I would highly recommend if anyone has questions, go ahead and, and see if you can can talk to one and build some rapport with uh, with one because they would be um, they would be a really good backup for you. Yeah, pharmacists are fantastic. So Igor, just some other questions. When when you're working with clients, then you mentioned that you would give them, for example, a pick list of foods or supplements or habits to say yeah. pick one thing. Um, yeah. Do you generally have um, kind of a fixed protocol for each client because you find that each client really could benefit from that approach? Or is your uh, approach very individualized because every client you're finding is slightly different? Yeah, it's fairly individualized. And, uh, and, and, and what I do is, um, well, I talk about this in, I think it's chapter six, um, which is literally in the chapter is titled individualization, mm -hmm. um, which is, um, we, we measure their blood pressure before and then kind of like a, like, like a tailor, a tailor starts when they're making a suit or a dress or whatever. Um, they start with the same piece of cloth for all clients. Then they take measurements and then they refine that piece of cloth, right? They cut, cut away what doesn't need to be there. That's um, a great analogy. I like that. Yeah. And same thing here. Uh, so I might start them, uh, the, the beginning may be very similar for all clients with hypertension, but measurements help me refine um the, the approach the supplements the nutrition the exercise and the sleep so what i what i typically measure is i ask them to before i ever give them anything no recommendations uh, at all we do a one week baseline i get them to measure their blood pressure twice per day um first thing in the morning before any any food or drinks and last thing uh, right, right before bed so i get them to measure that twice per day send me the data um a week later so we have that reference i do the averages um, i also look at the highest and the lowest um, and then we, uh, then I have them pick one little thing and then we, we, we test that out. Um, we, uh, so they keep, they keep tracking their blood pressure morning and evening, sending me an Excel document at the end of every week. And we see how's it going. Is it working? And if so, uh, can we make it better? And if not, let's, let's change things. Um, a lot of things with supplementation, it's about testing out and figuring out the right dosage. Um, for example, in the book, I talk about one, one client I had, his name is George. Um, and George was a pretty big guy. Like he's not, not, not overweight, but big and tall and fairly like he's well-built. Uh, despite being well-built, have blood pressure. Uh, 210 ish pounds. And we started off at a dose of magnesium of 300 milligrams. Didn't work. We bumped it up by, I think either hundred or 200 milligrams, um, every three, four days. Um, didn't work until he reached about 2000 milligrams and I'm, and it oh. still didn't work. And I'm like, that's a high dose. I'm like, that, that's all uncomfortable. Uh, go, that's as far as I'm comfortable going with you, he says. But, you know, uh, I would like on my own to test it further at my own risk. Um, I say, okay, this is all on you, but I'm going to make sure you know the symptoms of toxicity um, so that if they do appear, you can back off on the dose. So I explained to him what the symptoms of magnesium, tox magnesium toxicity are. And he, on his own, kept raising it, raising it, raising it until he actually saw reductions at about 3,000 milligrams. I'm like super deficient. He was very, very deficient. Um, I'm like, I am glad I chickened out at 2000, but he kept going to 3000. So I'm, I'm glad that he kept going. Um, Cause again, he wasn't experiencing symptoms of toxicity um, at all, not even at 3000. And what um, would you say that the symptoms you would expect of toxicity would be? One is an abnormally low heart rate. If you're, if you know your resting heart rate, and one day you wake up and it's about six, uh, six beats per minute or more lower than your average, uh, that's the symptom of toxicity. Another one is uh, is lethargy. Another one is diarrhea. Um, another one is low body temperature. So these are all symptoms of magnesium toxicity. Mm -hmm. And if you do experience them, just back off on the dosing, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Really, really interesting. Yeah. So we test different strategies. So I have every client uh, measure morning, evening for one week, send me the information. Um, and then we figure out, do we do, do we increase the dose of either food or nutrition or exercise, or do we test a different strategy? Wow. Well, it, it makes a lot of sense. And then how do you find your clients to be in terms of receptivity? So when they're coming to you and you're introducing all the tracking and then one habit change at a time, it, do they like the structure that you're you're giving them, or do you get any pushback from clients saying, "Well, wait a minute here, this is a lot"? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I have two different types of clients. Some of my, I, I classify my clients as numbers oriented people and non numbers oriented people. <laughs> uh, now, I do a lot of presentations for the GTA Accountants Network. You can bet accountants are numbers people. They love tracking stuff and counting stuff. When I tell them to track this, they're all over that. Um, I also happen to speak to a lot of engineering companies. Engineers are also very, very much numbers people. They love tracking stuff. No pushback. They're like, no, I want to do more. I want to, I want to record more than what you give me. I'm like, cool, let's do that. Uh, whereas some people are not numbers people. Um, I also speak to uh, do some some presentations for the Toronto District, District School Board, um, it's, and, and and others that are not or nurses or healthcare professionals who are not necessarily numbers people. So with them, I'm like, all right, well, don't track, let's say every day, but uh, but let let's say track three times per week. You know, mm -hmm. I'd rather have more data than less, but some data is better than no than no data. Um, so sometimes I get pushback from the from the non numbers people, um, but uh, but. In, in terms of the recommendations, I almost never get pushback for the simple reason is that it's not me speaking at them. It's a, it's a conversation. It's a, it's a collaboration. We're in this together. Yeah, if you're negotiating them, a little bit to find where their, yeah. their comfort place is. Yeah, because I give them the choices. Um, it's their decision to make. It's not, it's not mine. Um, it's like, uh, no, I'm not a parent, but I read that uh, a good parent will give their child who's like three or four years old uh, a choice between yes and yes. Not yeah. yes and no. <laughs> exactly. Um, same thing here. I give them. I give them three or four very good choices. They can make any choice they want, and they can't go wrong. It's not mm -hmm. like, do you want to eat healthy or do you want to eat unhealthy? It's right. like, do you want to eat broccoli or do you want to eat garlic? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You pick. <laughs> Either way, yeah. we all win. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. great. So, oh. so yes, yeah, so from a perspective of behavior change, compliance, um, as long as it's it's palatable to them both like actually like the, their palate but also behaviorally um there's very little pushback and great compliance oh very good very good does anyone have any questions for igor by the way i love questions you love questions hey diana <laughs> so i had a question for you have you ever had to fire a client for non-compliance where you laid everything out and they're like, whoa, oh, this is too much. I'm actually not that bad. I'm feeling okay now about where I am. Or do you find that clients are like, let's go. This is starting to work. Give me more. I want to do more. Where, where does that sit for you? What, what are some yeah. of the things you had to do? In 15 years of personal training and uh, well, 800 plus clients between me and all my staff, we've never had to fire a client for non-compliance. Okay. Um, of course, there are, I mean, we, that's not to say that we, that we have 100% compliance. That's, that, that never happens. Right. However, uh, we work with adults and we tell them, this is what you need to do. Or can we, can we collaborate on, on what you need to do? Mm -hmm. um, they, they acknowledge that non-compliance is because of them. You know, um, right. it's, 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 it's their fault. So, so because of that, I'm like, well, you're an adult. You can make your own decisions. If this is the decision you're consciously making, um, then... Um, and then, then fine, I'll continue to work with you. If you're finding this beneficial, um, I'll continue to work with you. Now, if you're not finding this beneficial, cool, let's cut it off. Um, yeah. No problem, no offense taken. Uh, yeah. But as long as you find it's beneficial, I'm happy to keep working with you. And if it's, it's non-compliance because you feel you're not, you're not sticking to it, um, mm -hmm. cool, well, I'm on your side. You know, I, I want you to get the best results for you. Um, so let's just test out different strategies and we'll, we'll, we'll figure out why that works. Now, if on the other hand, if they're like, you know what? This actually isn't as important as I once thought it was. I'm like, cool. So if you don't want to keep looking, um, cool. I'm, 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 I'm gonna continue training you until you until you say uh, this is now important again, or I'm done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, these are great points because I think that one of the things we don't give ourselves enough credit for as kinesiologists um, is how amazingly huge our scope of practice is. We are the only healthcare profession other than naturopaths and dietitians, And I'm going to say, f no, physicians don't even have it in their core competencies that have nutrition in mm -hmm. our core competency. So if you read the Canadian Kinesiology Alliance's um, core competencies for kinesiologists, nutrition counseling is in there. We just Absolutely. finished a study of all the healthcare professions not to be found. So it's really something that as kins, we can use the guidelines that Igor is mentioning about exercise, about sleep, about um, supplementation, and also about, um, what was the other one? 
nutrition. Nutrition. Yep. I forgot that about nutrition. And by speaking to it in the way that you're not prescribing supplements, but you're saying, here's what nutrition, here's what the research says, um, then you can, you can provide options. So that's a very, very interesting way of uh, looking at the core competencies for nutrition and being able to make um, a huge um, difference with our, with our clients and being that um, broad about the recommendations that we can make, I think sets us apart quite a bit. I don't know that there's a lot of people that are talking about sleep and that are talking about uh, nutrition in quite the way that we could. We tend to think that kins know exercise, which we do inside out and backward. Yeah, um, but I don't think we go far enough into that lifestyle and then start wrapping it around to say, do you understand how sleep affects your exercise, which affects how you eat? So drawing those uh, connections for people, I think could make a huge difference in, in our um, client outcomes. Yeah, does First Line Education have any course on nutrition yet? Or, cause I saw you're doing a poll. Yes, we have one. We are, we are literally putting the final polish on and we are going to have an introductory webinar just to give people an idea of what's in it. Um, but it's a little bit of a beast because we go through these scopes of practice to show you how you can use nutrition in your practice. And then what are, just as Igor said, what are the biggest bangs for your client's buck that you can say is akin that would really help to make them uh, feel so much better mentally and physically uh, and emotionally as well. So those are, those are what we go through. So we, we talk about scope, first of all, and then we go through, here are the low hanging fruit that you can go through with your client. And here's how nutrition dovetails with sleep and nutrition. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. To anybody on the line who's listening to this, um, I, if, if you get the chance to take the first line nutrition course, I highly recommend it. Although I haven't taken it, I've taken four courses from first line back yeah, when I was yeah. a recent grad. Yeah, back way back in 2009. Yeah. Uh, and I highly recommend any course that first line uh, makes. And Angela did not ask me to say that, and I'm not getting paid to say that. <laughs> um, but I, but, uh, but again, this, this, uh, like uh, Angela's courses, like really gave me a great start in my career because I was a fresh grad. Um, I did not feel competent to do anything other than sit in the classroom, take notes and study for tests. Like I didn't know what a kinesiologist does. Uh, when I took the clinical assessment courses and the extra prescription courses, it really made me understand what do kids do and what can I actually do with my degree. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And, oh. and I'll uh, give a nod to you to Elise here because Elise is one of the instructors that teaches with First Line. And so she was helping and teaching in 2009. We go back a little ways. Right, so, um, yeah, you I remember. remember you. I yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, this this is the thing is is that I think that as kins, if we have a really good handle on the basics, there's nothing we can't do. Uh, I think that we tend to feel that if we can't wield needles and we can't do adjustments, that we're somehow not able to step up with our clients. And I think Igor has shown you this evening that by setting out this framework for your clients and being very, very particular about capturing hard data, about capturing objective data that you can then reflect back on, it keeps you on track and it keeps your clients accountable to you as well. So I think that's really something to consider, something to think about. Um, and whether you are using photographs, whether you are using blood pressure measurement, whether you're using a food diary, there's all kinds of ways that your clients can choose to track their own progress. So you can say here, blood tests, you know, here are all kinds of ways we can look at how you're doing a tape measure um, yeah. that, that we can study um, your progress. And so in, in light of that, I think it's, it's wonderful the way you've been able to say, just pick how, how would you like your progress measured? And, and then can I also suggest that we you know, put a scale in the mix or, or um, can we pick your favorite pair of jeans and put that in the mix yeah. as well? You know, exactly. it has to be emotionally relevant. It has to be emotionally relevant. Yeah. That's a really, really good point. Um, do you find then, um, Igor, that you give your clients a, a program that takes place over a certain number of weeks? Like, do you have like a package or like an, a certain number of sessions that you want your clients to commit to where you're pretty sure you're going to see results and you really want them in all in for that certain length of time. 
Yeah, um, I have my recommendations, but we also have three different packages. We have package of 15 sessions, 30 and 50. Um, and I tell them based on your goals, the amount of weight you need to lose the uh, and the amount of weeks it takes to lose that weight, um, here's the recommended package. Of course, it's up to them to make that decision, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I but we, we give them both options, either follow my recommendation or make your own choice. I'm fine with either one. So it's a great selling tool, isn't it? Is that we've we've talked and I understand that your goals are X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Here are the things that I'm recommending that we do together to help you get to that point. And, you know, based on science, we know approximately how long that will take you. So yeah, yeah you exactly. choose. I mean, once you start pulling out a calculator and you figure out the number of weeks, you're like, oh, it's not, it's not me saying it, it's the calculator saying it. Yeah, yeah, In yeah. The calculator. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's just numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Nothing personal. <laughs> That's no, right. No, no. <laughs> That's that's really really clever, really clever. Any other questions popping up for anyone as we chat? Anything that you've thought of? Maybe there's some questions about how to find clients, maybe, or how Igor. What's that? A favorite topic of mine. Go go right ahead. What what's your what's your favorite way? Now I noticed you mentioned that you do the public speaking, and then. Those people are on your mail list then, and then you've got a really great email marketing machine behind you. Can you can yeah. you describe a little bit about what that looks like for us? Sure. Um, so I actually do an entire, uh, so I, I used to speak regularly at the Naturopathic College. Uh, okay. One of the topics that I used to speak about was marketing. Um, and what I often said to naturopaths, uh, who no offense to naturopaths, but are not the most business savvy people, mm -hmm. um, but, um, if they are a new grad, if they have a pie chart of here is what their time looks like, if all they have is one patient and they're working 40 hours per week, they should be spending that one hour or whatever, two hours with a patient and 38 hours looking for patients. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. If they have 20 patients, let's say each patient is an hour, they should be spending 20 hours with a patient and then 20 hours looking for more patients. Um, oh, good. So you should be, uh, you should be, it's, it's a bit of a change in perspective. You, don't, you, you can't see yourself as, in the, in, as providing kinesiology services. You have to see yourself as in the business of marketing kinesiology services. Um, so it's a bit of a, of a perspective shift. Um, marketing, a, a lot of, especially healthcare professionals, we feel like marketing is kind of beneath us, but no marketing, no clients, no patients, no sales, no money. Um, so pretty simple. And, <laughs> it's very, it's, it's, it's that simple. And if you don't like it, fine, hire somebody else. Uh, but you got to do it either you or somebody has to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of your, your email list, it's by far one of the most profitable avenues you, you could use way more than social media, somewhere between 10 and a hundred times, not percent, times more wow. profitable than social media. Um, and I can go into all kinds of reasons why, but uh, what's way more profitable. Um, the thing is that the very important thing is to do it on a regular basis. Um, minimum once a week, more better two or three tests per week, but minimum once per week. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of misconceptions about email marketing, like you have to keep it short because people's attention spans are, are short. Not true at all. How long is Harry Potter? You know, four, five, <laughs> six pages times, five, I don't know, six, seven books. I'm not a Harry Potter fan. I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, but uh, people don't have short attention spans. There's a saying that you can't be too, too long. You can only be too boring. Oh, very good. Yeah, if, if I'm interested, interesting, I'll keep reading. <laughs> yeah, if it's interesting, you'll keep reading. If I and write, pop up in my my email inbox the next week, I'm like, oh, I wonder if, what he has yeah. to say this week. That's exactly it. Most yeah. of my, my articles are in the 1,500 to 3,000 word range. Um, they are hefty whopper articles. Yeah. Um, and yet, for the person who is irrelevant, one paragraph is too long. For the person mm -hmm. for whom it's very relevant. The three thousand words is not enough. Um, so You'll again, you can't be too long. You can only be too boring. Um, yeah. And the way you make it interesting is a writing with personality, not dry clinical academic. Because one of the mistakes that a lot of professionals make is they write as if they're writing for their peers, for their colleagues. Well, the colleagues aren't paying your bills. Your clients are. <laughs> uh, so write for the layperson. Um, use use slang. Use personality. Stick in facts about weird facts about yourself. For instance, my 6,000 newsletters and subscribers know they're like 1980s European pop. Um, <laughs> like, 
stick they they know that I love the movie Rocky Four. They know that I love Jackie Chan. Um, stuff like that. Uh, so you have to put in with personality. You have the, the it's a person that feels like it should be it, it's speaking to them. Um, so that's one of the biggest mistakes. And another big mistake is not focusing on building your email list. Mm -hmm. um, it's nice to write. It's nice to have people to write to. Because <laughs> if you're writing and nobody's reading it, well, it doesn't serve you much of a purpose. So you have to grow your email list. And when somebody's just starting out, I say go bare bones. You don't have to be, use any crazy tactics. Just send um, an email, an individual email, to every person in your inbox. Uh, basically saying, hey, I'm starting up a newsletter. It's going to come out once, request per week, whatever you decide. Um, here are here is three or four bullet point points about here's some interesting topics I'm going to chat about. If you want it, let me know. If you don't want it, respond back anyway, letting me know that you're not interested so that I know it's not lost in cyberspace. Um, simple as that. Now, expectations. About 5 to 15% of people will respond positively to that email and you have a new subscriber. For, for those that don't respond, two to three days later, send a second email saying, hi, name, comma, I'm not sure if you got my last email. Another five to 15% will sign up after that email because mm -hmm. um, don't give up after the first one. It's not a sign of disinterest. It could be busyness, could be it landed in a spam folder. It could be some, something else. Um, so so that, that's how you start. So first, start with emails. Second, look through your Facebook and your Instagram network and message, message them. Third, look through your phone, send text messages. Uh, fourth, look for look, look through your LinkedIn. By that point, you will have somewhere between one and 200 people to send emails to. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can look at fancier stuff, but this is your basically, this is your low hanging fruit. Um, and that, that's where you start. Um, and, uh, and again, you have to make it interesting, you have to make it compelling, and don't forget to follow up two to three days later if you don't get a response. Great advice, really, really good advice. And I think, for anyone who is a practitioner sitting there saying, oh, I don't have to do this because I don't work for myself. What an interesting thing you could do for the clinic that you work for. Because Absolutely. if you are able to build the client base for your clinic, oh, hey, you're probably going to get some of that business or you may work yourself into a nice side hustle for the clinic or the organization that you work for because maybe no one was doing that before and they could really use some help with promotion and just letting people know what the clinic's all about, highlighting some of the practitioners that are there and maybe talking about some of the people who uh, are attending the clinic and some of the results they're getting on behalf of the clinic. And hey, as a bonus, uh, if, you are, if you are working for a clinic and you're thinking of doing this, um, one thing you can do is you can work on a commission structure with them. Either those, those patients come to you or those patients go to other kinesiologists or physiotherapists or chiropractors and you get a commission on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Almost any, clinic, any, any clinic manager, director with any kind of business savvy knows they would rather have 15% of a sale than 100% of no sale. Exactly, exactly. And it's, it's not a small commission that you're looking for because this was yeah. business they never had before. Absolutely. So you need to think about this pretty clearly. And so that's something that as a new practitioner, that if you were able to bring to a business, I mean, as a business owner, I would jump all over that. I'd be like, oh, this is something I don't have the headspace for, or there's low hanging fruit. I didn't even know there was business in all of our, our clients' emails because it's not just the clients, it's their friends, their family, their own networks. And they're saying, you know what, my clinic is, they're just wonderful. I mean, I feel like I'm part of this community. They're always following up with me, telling me what they're up to. I'm now enrolled in their yoga classes, or now I'm actually uh, working on a, a new nutrition program with them. I didn't know they offered this kind of thing. Uh, or I'm yeah. getting some great information about what massage therapy is doing for my nervous system that I never would have had before. So Absolutely. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. By, by comparison, I, I offer the same thing to my staff. If my staff are, are able to send referrals, uh, whether that referral ends up working with a person who referred them or any one of mm -hmm. my other trainers, I can say $200 and $600 for that. Great. That's, that's fantastic. And so over the lifetime of your client, for Igor, that's nothing. Yeah, exactly. uh, but for someone who is actually giving that referral, imagine $600, $600, $600. That's, that's pretty yeah. sweet. That's making and a difference. Really make. I mean, if, if a kid gets paid 60 bucks an hour, uh, they would have to work 10 hours for that referral. 
yeah uh, for, for, for for that for that six hundred bucks for that right? money sure or sure send a, a three sentence email basically introducing you know the referral to the referee um and there you go how long did that take 30 seconds to two minutes yep exactly so as igor was saying you can negotiate a percentage of you know a, a package for example or you would negotiate a dollar amount for every for every single referral so there's other options there for negotiation as well yeah, great so idea you're leveraging yeah. your time and your, your, your network your connections etc yeah yeah, for sure. Definitely, definitely. Anyone have any questions that popped up at all? Igor, what advice would you give a kinesiologist just getting started in our industry? Um, first pick, uh, well, let me ask first. Um, is this kinesiologist working for a clinic or for themselves? Let's see, I'm looking at everybody here. There's a lot of new faces here. They're probably, let's say, working for a clinic. They're probably within the first two to three years of practice, and they're probably working for someone else at this point. Okay. Um, I would say be very, very, very client-centric. Um, in so There's a saying that people, uh, people, people buy you for the results, but they stay for the relationship. Uh, they stay because they like you as a person. Uh, you might have some kind of connection, like you like 1980s Europop. Uh, you might have some kind of connection of they like some kind of um, exotic activity that very few people know about, but you like that too. Um, so be very, very client centric and learn about your clients' lives outside of you know their their joints and their bones and their muscles. Uh, learn about their kids. Learn about their vacations when possible. Uh, learn about uh, learn about what uh, what they like to do, um, and if you you know if if I pass by something that's fairly inexpensive and I buy that for my client, for example, one of my clients she loves glow in the dark mini golf, um, <laughs> and so yeah. so I passed by a mini golf place. I bought her a fifty dollar gift card, um, and she she thought the world of it. Um, I didn't do it as a tactic or anything. I did it because I thought it put a smile on her face. Um, although it, the fact that she ended up renewing for, you know, 2000 bucks, that's nice, but that wasn't my intention. Um, so just so be very, very, we're challenged a little bit there because we, we have to do things that are probably pretty small. We we're not able to do anything that's, that would be yeah. a significant dollar amount, but, but definitely, you know, to your point, um, you know, sending people an article or, you know, yeah. making sure that they, that they know that there's an event coming up that they might really like, um, something like that, or taking, going out for a walk and finding a photo that your client would really enjoy and sending them the photo, you know? Yeah, but if you're, if you're not allowed to, to buy anything for your clients, there's tons of stuff you can do. Let's say you read about, uh, for example, one other thing I like is boxing. If somebody sent me a, um, a, um, an article about this boxer that I like, for example, let's say it's Manny Pacquiao or if anybody's ever heard of him. Um, I'm like, oh, that's cool. They, they thought of that, they remember that. Or yeah, if they take a picture of something that reminded them of me, I'm like, oh, that's cool. They're thinking about me when they're not with me. Um, so yeah, there's definitely avenues there. So be very, very client centric. Um, as you know, a big bookworm, I like to recommend books. Um, yeah. So there's a very good book called The Power of Moments, Power of Moments. Oh. Um, by two 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 brothers uh, two authors named Chip and Dan Heath. Oh yeah, yeah yeah. Now, another very very good book is called um, I don't remember if it's called Never Lose a Customer Again or Never Lose a Client Again. Oh, the author's thanks. name is Joey. I don't remember his last name. Thank you. Okay. No problem. We'll post these. Sure thing. Yeah, no, that's great. So thank you for that. Did anyone have any other questions? Such a quiet group. <laughs> yes, very well behaved. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we blew by another hour. I mean, I can't believe how fast these Mondays go, but I wanted to thank all of you for coming out. And Igor, thank you very much. You are a fast talker. You're a fast thinker. Um, you're full of great ideas. And I love your enthusiasm for our industry and for the well being of clients because I think that you're getting results. Obviously, your clients are getting results. And so that's 
it just says the world about what we can do as kin. So in that sense, it's super appreciated that you and your business is doing so well because it only helps everybody else. <laughs> My pleasure. This is a lot of fun for me. Like uh, this is definitely, um, it hardly feels like work. A lot of people think I'm crazy because I didn't take a uh, vacation in 16 years. And I'm not saying they're wrong because that's true. I am crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the reason I haven't taken a vacation in 16 years is because this is fun for me. Um, it's like I get to wake up in the morning and I, and I basically spend time with my friends. And it's definitely they pay me for spending time with them and getting in better shape. Um, yeah, and, and also learning about marketing and sales and all that kind of stuff. That's It's, it's like a huge, big experiment for me. Um, my business is not just a source of income. It's a source of entertainment, too. <laughs> It's a great, great way to do it. Great way to do it. So you're able to work with clients and be this prolific at the same time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't even own a TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wouldn't have time to watch it. So yeah. Exactly. That so one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Igor. Don't forget to claim your free book um, at uh, www.fitnesssolutionsplus.ca forward slash kinesiology. It's in the chat there. Thank you, Igor. I really appreciate that. And My pleasure. I'm Thank you. Sure, no problem at all. I am sure you will be back because we will drag you back when you uh, finish your next book. <laughs> I would love to. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good evening. See ya. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. That was great. Yeah, my pleasure. This is one of my favorite topics. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. That was Deanna was my roommate in university. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we go back a long, long way. So uh, we've reconnected through this group, actually, uh, wow. which has been which has been just great. So um, our group is almost getting close to the number of OKA members. I would love your wow. help in just trying to build the the numbers that we have here because i think we have such a great captive audience for building the profession for you finding the kins you need to find and yeah. also getting clients uh results which is one of the things where i think if kins can shine um because of our huge scope of practice i think it's really something that um we can we can build in significant ways so i really appreciate all yeah. your all your work to help do with this my pleasure. I'll, I'll look through my uh, friends list and I'll, I'll, I'll see who I can add to uh, to the group and I'll do that over the next uh, day or two. Wonderful. That That's just amazing. Thank you. So yeah, have fun. a wonderful evening and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch. That sounds good. Good awesome. night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.